there. Timothy. So I usually send out via email um, just a lesson that I'm doing so it's easier to follow along. As well, you can kind of fact check me. You know, go back, double check what I say, and, and learn is it from God or is it from the pastor. But, um, you know, just beginning off, I was thinking about it. You know, we can have so many opinions. Oh, yeah. Right? And it's funny about how many opinions a, a certain person can have. Yeah. Have you ever got into it with someone and just started arguing about the most ridiculous opinions? Yes. Well, anyone, pretty much raise your hand. Do you have a brother or a sister? So everyone who raised their hand, you know what I'm talking about. Um, for my life, the person that I argued with the most about anything and everything was my older brother, Eric. Mm. Now, there was this point in time where we were in Sydney, and we actually started arguing for about 40 minutes about how much Nutella we should put on our sandwich. Oh, yeah. See, this, this is important, guys. See, there's usually two schools of thought. <laughs> when you are broke, this is important. <laughs> so either you have one school of thought, is that you put a lot of Nutella on, so it fills you up, mm. and so you have that nice, thick sandwich. Or the other school of thought is you put a little bit of Nutella on because you want to get fooled up by the bread because bread is cheaper than Nutella. Wow. See, you want to see what I'm See, I was on the second uh, end of it. I was like, bro, we can't put that much Nutella on. We only have this much. And we literally argue about it for an hour. Like, it, it was not a good thing. <laughs> um, but the thing is, when we talk about opinions, one of the things that most of us can have an opinion on is leadership. We have an opinion about how people should lead. Right. You know, we can have all the opinions on the world, but when the draw falls on you, how do you respond to leadership? See, most of us, when it comes to leadership, we're actually very terrified about the idea of us leading. Because we know the saying, right? We've watched all 12 of the Marvel movies. With great power comes great responsibility. We've seen all the movies. But we understand with with, with leadership, we know that there are areas where we are lacking. We know how much effort it's going to take to fill in the gaps. We know that leadership is going to push us if we put ourselves in it. But as we read along here in 1 Timothy, let's remember for a moment of what Paul has been talking about so far. He's been addressing Timothy as he's leading many, many churches in Ephesus in how to build a correct church. And now he's going to start talking about leadership, where he's going to say and really put this notion on our minds and on our hearts that leadership is one of the most important parts of a church. There's a saying that says everything rises and falls with leadership. See, the Bible says that the body of Christ is actually the church, meaning the church is an organism. And this organism needs organization and this organization needs oversight. And so my title simply for this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 3, if you're, you're turning in your Bibles, is Build Me a Church. Point number one, build on character. See, when it comes to leadership, my first question to you is, I guess the first question that we must answer is, what qualifies us to be a leader? You know, how would you choose to be a leader? Some organizations or some people use the talent show method. The person who's the most talented, you're the one who's the leader. Mm -hmm. Some other organizations, and even churches, use the uh, boy band method. Mm -hmm. The most good-looking person gets to play. <laughs> right? And there's so many different, and that's probably why I got the job, that is true. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's so many other ways that people choose leadership. Yeah. I know that sometimes it's only based off of who's available, yeah. who actually applied for it. I know back in high school, I felt bad that there was this one club that nobody was really applying to be president. And I was like, whatever, I feel bad. So I raised my hand. I was like, okay, I'll apply for it just for the sake of applying for it. And I actually got the vote and I became president of some club. And uh, I never did anything. I never showed up to any of the meetings, never did anything. Maybe there was no meetings because I didn't organize it. That was probably my idea. <laughs> I don't know. But, but, you know, sometimes people do that. Who, who, who's in it? What we're going to see here is that, you know, the most essential leadership in the world it's not the president or somebody leading a country. It actually boils down to the leadership in a church. And we're going to see the qualifications of how do we choose these leaders. Yeah. 1 Timothy 3, 1-7. through 7. 
Here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, um, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not coarsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. He must do so in a manner worthy of respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Mm -hmm. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also be a, have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's traps. So we see here Paul giving Timothy kind of this long list, again, of leadership. But starting off just in verse 1, let's see what he says here when he says this is a trustworthy saying. Mm. He starts off and he admonishes those who are inspiring to be a leader. We're going to look into what an overseer means, but at this point, just understand there's someone who wants to be a leader. And he says that this is a good thing because what they are aiming to do, and he calls it a noble task. In other translations of the Bible, it reads a good work. He said, this is a good thing for them. This is, they have to understand they're aspiring to a noble task. And sometimes we, re, we need to remember that it is both of those things. One, it is noble and good. And the second, it is a task and it is a work. First of all, it is noble. You should be lifted up when you want to be a leader. Because many are not going to give up the things like you will. True. Most people in their life, they're just going to look at their dreams. What do I want? What, what, what can I get from the time that I'm spent here on earth? Instead of you that is looking at how can I give up everything I have and give to others. Paul noticed that this is a noble and good thing to do. But he also said, hey, this is a work. This, this is a task. This is a job that you're going to have to give blood, sweat, and tears in. In fact, if you're, not, if you're doing it and it's not hard, you're probably not doing it correctly. It's kind of like working out, right? If you went to the gym and you came back to the buddy of yours at the end of the night, man, that was so easy. They're like, well, you didn't do it right then. <laughs> in the same way, when you are doing it right in the church, when you're leading correctly, by the end of the night, you should be like, oh my gosh, that was hard. Yeah. That, 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 that should, because you've given it your all. Mm -hmm. you, you, you left it all on the table. See, God is looking for workers who are willing to put in the hard work to progress his kingdom. Because it's going to be hard work to constantly feed the church with sound doctrine. Mm -hmm. To guard the church against the attacks of the savage wolves who are trying to come in. It's hard work to model unselfish service when faced with an individualistic world. Where everyone's focused on the self, but you have to model, hey, I've got to be unselfish. But there's a saying here that I really always treasured in my heart is, more sweat now, less tears later. Mm -hmm. And the more hard work that we put in now the less that we're going to be regretful or doubting later on. Mm -hmm. So he says this. He says, hey, this is whoever inspires to be a leader, especially within the church of God, it's going to be one noble. It's a good thing he's lifting them up, but it's going to be hard work. And most people understand that this is going to be hard, and I believe Paul would have known that more than anybody else. Yeah. But here, it's awesome that he lifts them up because, I don't know about you, but what's your favorite word in English? For me, I, I love the word thrive. Mm. Um, it's, just, it's just something, it, it, it rhymes with a lot of other words too. Which, <laughs> you, know, you can always put it, don't survive, thrive. Like You can put it in a lot of different, different sermons, but I, I love that word. But another beautiful word that, if used correctly, anyways. That's actually a very beautiful word. Think about the people that, that inspire to be a leader. Mm. They have seen the pain before them. They're going to go for it anyways. They know that in some parts of this journey, they're going to be alone. They're going to go anyways. My heart is going to be damaged by the people that I love. They are going to love anyways. Anyways is such a beautiful word. I even want to lift up, you know, Douglas and Monica. Come on, Monica. Yeah, we keep talking about Samoa, but there, there are some feelings there. I've come to, to New Zealand and Auckland to give my whole heart, and now God's changing it. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm going to go anyways. Yeah, yeah. 
I have some feelings and some doubts. Is it going to work out? Is it going to happen? What about my career? I'm going to go anyways. Yeah. That's a, that's a beautiful word. Yeah. When someone adopts it into their life, of, I'm just going to do it anyways. So he talks about it here, Paul. And he says, going back to kind of the terminology, he says, anyone who inspires to be an overseer. Now, throughout the Bible, you'll come around a lot of different terms that kind of describe a pastor. You'll even see it here that when we read this lesson, if you have been part of the church for the last month or so, we just went through the book of Titus, and it was talking about elder. And this is almost like the same list, Titus 1, 5 through 9. An elder is actually the same thing as an overseer. And what it really means is someone who is overseeing. It's not actually a religious term in this context. Today, we might use pastor, elder, and overseer and religiously. But back then, it was more of a term of like management, like a manager. It's something where I can't do everything, but I can see that everything gets done. See, the Greeks used this word overseer because what they had was, in the Greek culture, they had this dream to spread Greek culture around the world. And so they would have these mother cities, and they would plant these smaller cities, but putting the culture in there. And they would send overseers there to manage the resources that the mother city is giving these smaller cities. This overseer, he would go in and first inspect the progress of the new city, identify where things are not going as well as they should, and then give relief or help from the supplies that have been sent by them by the mother city. So these guys were mainly there to oversee that the city was being in, in, in progress as correct. And we see here that even Jesus was kind of the same thing when they used him as an overseer. You'll read here in 1 Peter 2, 23-25. It says here, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judge, judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body and on the cross, so that we may die to our sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. For you who were like sheep had gone astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. Even Jesus is described as an overseer. See, what did he do when he first came down here? He first came down here and he inspected the world. He looked at it. He said, what's going on, bro? He identified what was going on in the people's hearts, the sin, the religiousness, and most of the Pharisees. And then he brought relief by his sacrifice. So we see here that we are being called to a very noble task if we inspire to be like Jesus. Mm. But when you read throughout here, whenever it talks about in the New Testament an overseer, an elder, or even a pastor, the New mm. Testament actually gives a lot to be imagined in, uh, to leave up to our imagination. Meaning, it doesn't answer a lot of questions about it, actually. How many elders or overseers should we appoint in the church? It never says. What powers or, or, or authorities should the overseer or the pastor have, specifically? It doesn't really say. How long should they leave for? It doesn't say. The only thing that the Bible is clear about is their character. That's it. All these other things we can debate and have opinions on, but he's saying character is not debatable. This is what they need. See, so many people can have so many opinions in the world, but character is all that really matters. Even think of that kind of notorious name, Donald Trump. Right? So many people can have opinions on him. And there's actually kind of like this social experiment that happened in America where... People were going around and uh, going out and telling his, his policies to the public and saying, hey, do you support his policies on immigration? And at first, everyone was supporting it because they were like, wow, that sounds great. That sounds awesome. Because they kind of twisted it and they said, hey, these are the policies of their opponent. So they would say, hey, uh, if you know kind of American politics, uh, Donald Trump is uh, a Republican and his kind of opponent of the other party is Dem Democrats. And uh, so they were saying, hey, these are the policies of the Democrats. And at first, everyone was super supportive. Wow, that's awesome. That's great. And then right at the end, they're like, actually, sorry, there's one missed fact. It's actually Donald Trump's in there. Like, oh, okay. Right? Because nobody actually knows Donald Trump's policies. Ask someone. Hey, you don't support him? No. Okay, what are his policies? No idea. 
right? It, it, why do people have such a big opinion on it? Because of his character. Mm. I said, no, e even the opposite. They do the same thing with the Democrats and Republicans. Hey, do you support this person's policy, but it's Donald Trump? No, I hate it, it's Donald Trump. <laughs> right? It, 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 it's, it's because people are judging people based off their character. Mm -hmm. And it's the same when we are Christians. See, people don't care if you're a Christian if they don't see your character first. Same thing in leadership. In leadership, character is more important than structure. There is no structure in the world that can support bad character. No matter how great the boat is being built, how great the resources are, if you don't have a good captain, that boat is intended to sink. Mm. You know, some people might even come in where you look at a particular church and you see, okay, well, maybe the discipleship's not that good. Maybe there's some lukewarm people in the church or maybe not everyone is sharing their faith in that church. Most people will respond, well, we just got to change the structure, guys. You know, maybe we just got to have more Bible studies or call people out more and stuff. When actually the Bible is saying, no, the structure is not the problem. The character of your leaders is the problem. That's a, that's a hard teaching right there. Yeah. That, no, 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 don't, do, don't be tempted to go in and change the structure of a church. Get your leaders to care about the flock. Go in there and teach your leaders to know what they're talking about. Get the leaders to be sincere. Get them to actually care. No structure is going to build that in a character, in, in, in a leader. you got to actually find people who really want to care. Mm, come on. See, God uses character to choose his leaders. See, we don't do it by random. We don't actually pick those who just desire to be a leader. And we don't actually pick those who are natural born leaders. We are looking for character. So what does it say about our character? In verses 1 through 3, it says, a man of manners. Meaning, yes, they have to have manners. They're supposed to be, you know, it says here to be temperate, self-controlled, respectable. But also in the manner of God. That's how they need to act. They need to have the character of God. Talking about here not to be violent or quarrelsome. You know, somebody, a man who will let God fight his cause. Not someone who's just going out there for no reason. Verses 4 through 5, a man of management. It says here that he is to manage his own family. Which this actually puts in, in the church as well, is that we are not to rule, we are to manage. Very different things. We are not to come down here with, a, with an iron sword or anything like that. We are here just to manage, to love people. And the last one, verse 6 through 7, is a man of maturity. One thing he says that we should not do is appoint a leader who has recently been converted. It warns us, actually. It says, if you appoint a recent convert, they can end up just like the devil. That not rushing in people into leadership is for their own good. Again, just to help you with this, this doesn't mean you can't serve in the church. Service and leadership are different within the church. If you want to come out and help set up chairs of the church, I'm not going to look into you. Are you a violent man? Like, maybe if you are known to throw uh, chairs at people, I might you know, prohibit that service for you. But, but in most cases, if you want to serve in the church, that's okay. But if you want to lead, you need to have character. And character is something that develops. Right? But when we look throughout this list, sometimes our own list that we put on ourselves or we put on other people don't actually match up with God's list. Sometimes we're judging people by our own self-righteousness. Well, he can't be a leader. He's not a good speaker. Wow. Does it say that? Mm. He can't be a good leader. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't have an in-depth knowledge of the Bible. Is, is, that, is that a quality of a leader? No, it says here simply that they need to have character. See, character is not made in theology schools. Character does not come from leading a youth group. Character comes from perseverance. Mm -hmm. Romans 5, 3 through 4 says, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering per, uh, produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. 
Mm. Meaning character builds a bridge for us to actually achieve our hope in our lives. Meaning the only hope of this church growing and spreading is your character. Mm -hmm. That is the only hope. Why do you think we call everybody to leadership in the church? It's not because we're calling everybody to take responsibility. It's not because we're calling everybody to be good speakers or to come up here and, and give a lesson. That has, that's the least of our duties. We are calling everyone simply because we want you to grow in your character. Mm. That is why we call everyone to leadership. See, our structure cannot save us from a lack of character growth in our congregation. No, no matter how much discipling or Bible talks and we split Bible talks, whatever, have all these different services, that will not save us from us just simply growing. But this list, if you look at it, I'm like, well, how am I supposed to change anything? This is not my character. This list is not a disqualifying list almost. Meaning if you were a man, you're like, well, you know, that guy, he, got, he lost a temper 10 years ago. He's never going to be a leader. Like, that, that's not what it means. <laughs> It's mainly looking at here, Paul's putting on Timothy, you are to find people who desire to be this. People that are simply looking to grow in their life. Yeah. You know, because this is, this is encouraging us that, that this is, the church is built off character, not talent. And this is something that means all of us can do. See, when it comes to talent, there are some things that we just do not have the talent to do. I don't know about you, but uh, to be honest, sometimes I can have an oversense of confidence. Um, every time that me and Tegan are watching any type of show, the very first thing is I can do that. that, that that's, most of the, that's most of what's coming out of my mouth. Even like the American ninja warriors and stuff. That's easy. I can do that. You know? <laughs> but rarely is the case that I can do these things. But what's encouraging is that we can all look at this and say, I can do that. Yeah. yeah. Every single one of us. Why? Because even if you're lacking in one area, you can grow in that. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true. Right? You're able to grow to be more respectable. You're able to grow to stop arguing or be more gentle. Come on, Sean. This shows us that every single person can grow in our character. Wow. My first challenge to everyone here is grow in your character. I dare you to focus on yourself. Yeah. Just for a moment. Just say, how can I grow? Look at this list and see where you are falling short and just simply decide to grow. Point number two, build on a team. Mm -hmm. We see that leadership is not just built off men, but also, you know, women character. But we're going to see that what do we need to build around this man and this woman that is leading in the church. In 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, then they may serve as deacons. In the other way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malice talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife, and must manage his children and his household well. Those who will serve well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. So here we see that he's talking about this different term, deacons. Now this word deacon simply is not so much an office, actually. It's not like a title. It's more of kind of like a responsibility. The word deacon in Christianity designates a Christian who just wants to serve with the overseer or the elder of a church in various ways. Meaning it's not so much like a title you give someone, it's just someone a part of his team, a part of his right hand, left, left, left hand man that he's looking in the church. And a special note, other than like an overseer, a woman is called to be a deacon as well. We know this in Romans 16.1. I commend it to you, our sister uh, Phoebe, a deacon of the church. So we see here that women and men are called to be deacon, are called to serve within the church. So this gives us in our heart that first Paul is talking to Timothy, hey, you got to be, you got to find people who are going to lead with character. Yeah. But even more so, we can't just do it all off of one person. We need a team around them that has character mm -hmm. as well. 
that, that the church is built off a team, not just one person. We see throughout the text that this is true. Jesus had a team. He had his apostles. The very first thing he did in his ministry was not just go seek and say, well, he built a team first. We saw Paul, the great missionary, he had a team. He had Silas, he had Timothy, writing to one of them. We saw Moses had a team going up to Pharaoh. But this is, can be difficult sometimes when you grow up where you're only relying on yourself. And you don't really like having a team around you. I know that was something that I struggled with growing into leadership. Something that I struggle with even becoming a Christian is realizing I'm going to need help. See, for most of my life, I've I, I lived kind of like on my own back. See, for some of you um, that don't know my life, so I was, in a short story, I was taken away when I was seven years old to an orphanage because my father passed away when I was younger and my mom was a, a, addicted to drugs. And we weren't going to school. We went to school like once a week or something. And so we got taken away uh, by the authorities. And... The, the interesting thing was, is that they never told us why. And so it built in me, it was my fault. And so I just became the best that I could. I literally walked with my hands straight, never moved my hands, yes sir, yes ma'am, and just got like the best grades because I thought that if I was better, then I can go back with my mom. And that I obviously grew, like I, I grew to understand the, the situation I was part of. But that always stuck with me as in, it was based off of me. That I it wasn't looking at anybody else, never asked my parents for much, never asked and got open with my brothers or sisters. It was just me. And so it was for the most difficult thing when I actually became a Christian, was just learning how to open up to people. Learning how to, to allow people to come into my life and be my team. Bye. And see, this is it, that as a church, the, the leader that just wants to do it all themselves, it's never going to work. Mm. That the church is built off a team. Mm. But it gives us here another list. That this team needs training. Yeah. It starts off in verse 8. It needs training in their traits. That it's not going to be a team just based off your best friends. Mm. It, but instead it's going to be people with a good reputation of honest traits. Talks about here they need to be trustworthy, sincere, not indulging in much wine, or pursuing dishonest gain. They, they, they need to be good people. The second thing is that they need to be trained in their truths. That unlike the, the overseers, they are not called to teach. They are just called to have conviction. The overseers, they, they, these people need to learn how to teach. The evangelists need, need to learn how to teach. The deacon, just have conviction. Surround yourself with people with conviction. Yeah. That the behind closed doors, they are not bounce, bouncing back and forth in their doctrine. Mm. Read here in Ephesians 4, 14 through 16. There will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunningness and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is ahead that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting limb, grows and builds itself in love as each part does its work. Wow. See here, it's talking about you got to surround yourself with people that just straight up have conviction. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not talking about how they believe and, oh, I believe in the Bible, I believe in God. But even conviction in their actions. You know, if you have conviction, show it in your actions. If you have a conviction in your purity, show up your life. If you have a conviction seeking and saving the lost, focus on other people. That's what it's talking about. Surround yourself with people who simply have conviction, who are motivated not by your overseeing, but motivated by the word of God. Mm -hmm. It goes on here is that people are going to need to be trustworthy in their testing. In verse 10. You know, it says again that they must be first tested. You know, there's that famous saying that faith not tested cannot be trusted. Mm. You know, we, we, this is saying that we are not trying to surround ourselves with people that hopefully they'll show up to the task. Mm. Hopefully they'll make it. No, this is somebody who has done it and proven worthy and okay, now you can be part of my team. Mm. Some people are kind of waiting to get the title to display the character sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
I'm waiting until the testing comes and then I'll, 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 I'll do what I'm called to do. That is not the people we're looking for. Because in fact, some people are like that actually. In fact, you'll see it. Sometimes people actually produce quite well when you put them into leadership. But even Paul's saying, that's not the point. We're not looking for just people who are producing, we're looking for people with character. Even before they have the title, they need to be displaying the character. Some people will, but how do I get tested? You know, well, I promise you, don't worry about that question. <laughs> God is an amazing, an amazing teacher. Yeah. But the first thing I would like to put to your least to your attention is everything is a test. Did you show up early? Are you on time? Are you respectful? Everything is a test. Just, 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 if you put that in your heart and in your mind, then you'll start to pass the test. Mm -hmm. When you think, oh no, I, I, I can slack off a bit here, or I don't have to, I'm not put to the test now, that, then that's usually when you're failing in your life. Mm -hmm. The last one, and it talks about actually specifically with the women, and again, this is to note kind of two different things. Maybe this is talking about the, the deacon's wife, or it's talking about the, the women who are deacons, so either or. But it talks about here that we're going to be, need to be trusting, right, when you come into leadership. It specifically talks about with women is that they're going to need to have respect, restraint in what they say, reasoning, and reliable. These are, these are a couple different things that you need to build around your team. The fourth thing is that they, they need to have a good testimony. It says here through 12 through 13 that, you know, they should be faithful to their wife. They have to have great, uh, excellent standing and assurance that people around them should be like, man, this is a good person. Talking about almost back to what we talked about the overseer, that they are above reproach, right? I think that's why I love having, having uh, Chris as one of my right-hand men. Chris, he's a funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> there are some things I look at, I wouldn't have done it that way. But... He's somebody I look at and I, I can't fault him. Mm -hmm. He has an amazing heart and he keeps giving, 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 giving. Come on, Chris. And that's something I, I love. He, he, he has an excellent standing to, in my eyes. Come on, bro. Because, okay, I, I would have done something different, but Amen. This is, this is an awesome brother here. Yeah, come on. See, and why is he saying all these things? He starts to list out these different characteristics. You've got to make sure that this is not an opinionated matter. You've got to find these characters. He, he says it all for this purpose in verse 14 through 16, and coming up to a close in, in, in the sermon. It says, although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing these instructions so that if I am dis, dis, uh, excuse me, delayed, you will know how much people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, and seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed in the world, was taken up in glory. We can kind of read here that Paul kind of gets ahead of himself. He starts going for glory about Jesus, you know, and he gets excited about that. But he, he, he talks about, at least in the beginning, of why he was saying all these things. He was saying that we... We, we need character, and we need a team so that the church can stand. That we, we, we need the church to have a stable place in the world. Have you ever tried doing something all at, by yourself and got mad at others? <laughs> <laughs> I know I used to do that a lot, because I said I was very independent and stuff. I'd be doing things, everything, and I'm getting all stressed out. Why isn't anybody helping me? <laughs> you know? Sometimes it's kind of like when people don't give their heart to people and feel alone. You know, it's that same like, what are you talking about? But it says here that, that we need a team to run the church. Yeah. Why is it so important? Because it says here that the church is the pillar and the foundation of the truth in verse 15. Wow. Meaning it is the stability of the truth. When the, when the church is not doing its job correctly, the truth has no place to stand. See, people will judge the truth by those who are willing to. They see, oh, wait, hey, they have the Bible, that's true, that's cool. But they don't see a character in there. They don't see people who are actually following with all their heart. They're going to start doubting the truth. People do that all the time, right? Oh, I went to church before when I was young, but there was a bad experience I had in the church, so I, I don't believe in God anymore. 
they have judged the truth about God based off of other people's misinterpretation of it. Mm. That's why it's so important to Paul here. He's saying, you, you, gotta, you gotta build a church. Build a church where the truth has a chance to stand strong. Build a church on character. Build a church that, if it's in distress, it's not based off its structure, but it needs to be blamed off its character. Mm. Build a church around a team of people who are wholeheartedly in their service to God. See, this is not a one-man show, but God is using all of us equally. Yeah. See, here in conclusion, Paul is just writing this and, 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 and getting out all the different opinions and saying, this is important because we are the holders of the truth. See, guys, our last challenge and our last encouragement for all of us is, guys, let's build a church. Yeah. We have the opportunity here while we are still very small as a church, but let's build it off a good foundation. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about what structure we want or how, how we're going to build and go off to the next city and stuff. Those are inspiring. Those are good. Structure is good. It's awesome. But our character. Yeah. Let's build a church where the truth can stand and God can be proud. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.